Yeah, it's, uh, it's great to have Igor Pikovsky from um, University of um, um, uh, Stockholm. And he did his PhD in University of Vienna around 2009 to 2014. Then he moved to Harvard University as a postdoctoral fellow, he stayed there for four years. And then he, he, was in, uh, he was a faculty somewhere in America, I've forgotten. Um, yeah, at, uh, at the Stevens, Stevens Institute of Technology. Technology. Yes. Before he moved to that's, uh, uh, Stockholm. That's next to Manhattan. <laughs> so from Manhattan to all the way to Albanova. Igor, here we go. Your exactly, yeah. Of yours. All right, Anupam, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, kind introduction, but even kinder invitation. So that's really nice. This is really a topic that's very dear to my heart. Uh, so I really enjoy uh, uh, this community. But also, it's very nice to see many old familiar faces. Sorry, not old faces, but uh, familiar faces for a long time. So uh, that's nice. Um, so here, I want to talk about. Um, uh, kind of a research uh, um, uh, endeavor that we did with my collaborators and now also some other people also working in this field on quantum interferometry in the presence of time dilation, in particular the presence of gravitational time dilation. Uh, so this is a, a research field we studied about, we started about 10 years ago. And in this talk, I want to give a little bit of an overview of some of the older results. And maybe if there's time, a little bit about the newer results as well in this um, direction. Um, and uh, yeah, if I recall, Anupam, remind me, it's about 45 minutes. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Then uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll look at the clock. And if I, if I start getting over time, please uh, let me know. Um, OK. So uh, first, let me just uh, talk about very briefly about the interplay between quantum optics and gravity, which is my personal research interest now for a decade or so. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting interplay um, and uh, it's not um, that common, I think, but becoming more and more, uh, more and more uh, bigger field. Um, and in particular, uh, there's quite a rich uh, um, whole, uh, um, uh, broad aspects of this interplay that could be studied. Uh, so uh, labeling low energy quantum mechanics um, as kind of, uh, you know, this non-relativistic quantum mechanical approach that we take, um, and then how that uh, um, interfaces gravity uh, is what I, I think is particularly interesting. And here's just a very brief overview of the different aspects of that. One is um, simulators and analog systems. Um, and so in particular, there's, of course, a lot of research since the 90s, um, maybe even before, but I, I think... Uh, it was also strongly pioneered by Ulf Leonhardt in the 90s, uh, showing that you can actually find analog optical systems, uh, even classical ones, but also quantum mechanical ones later on, which um, uh, behave as, uh, as gravitational systems. So there is a mapping between a gravitational metric um, and uh, index of reflection, for example. But there's other systems as well where you can map some very interesting GR phenomena to quantum mechanical uh, systems that you can study in the lab. Uh, so BECs, for example. Um, then there's a different aspect of this interface, uh, which is high precision measurement. And so that's, of course, a very active field of research uh, in that we use quantum tools, quantum sensing, uh, to learn more about gravity. And so one prime example is, of course, gravitational wave detection, which utilizes uh, quantum metrology. Um, and then there's uh, other interesting aspects of it, levitating spheres or other quantum systems that could measure with very high precision novel aspects of gravity. Um, more theoretically, uh, on the kind of conceptual side, uh, it's quite interesting as well to see where the quantum optics uh, methodology interfaces uh, aspects like cosmology or aspects of cosmology. So one prime example is inflation, where you have uh, Bogolyubov transformations, which are effectively two mode squeezers, and they play a very major role to explain how quantum fluctuations really imprint themselves on um, observable um, uh, signatures today. Uh, and so this quantum optics uh, tools, the mindset uh, can have relevance for cosmology. And, and I think there's other examples there as well. Uh, so we explored something speculative a couple of years ago uh, with Avi Leb, for example, and also now studying something with my student Vasilis in this aspect, uh, respect. Um, another interface of low energy quantum mechanics and gravity is really uh, the quantum information side, uh, conceptual quantum information side. Uh, so trying to understand 
the properties of entanglement and many body systems and how that reflects both mathematically and maybe conceptually to uh, issues we encounter in gravity such as black holes or so so there are there seems to be connections between for example error correction codes and, and black holes and ads cft and so forth and so there is a lot of very interesting uh, deep insights to be gained uh, from a quantum information uh, mindset and quantum information uh, tools and then finally uh, kind of my main interest i think personally uh, is uh, are, are these two aspects one is a quantum gravity phenomenology namely what are signatures actually of uh, quantum gravity or maybe models of quantum gravity at low energies and one fantastic example is of course you know the co-authored by many of the organizers here a uh, paper from a couple of years ago uh, where uh, one can show that actually using low energy clever low energy experiments uh, utilizing quantum effects one can learn something about uh, the quantum nature of gravity. Uh, and you know, similarly, there's also many proposals for speculative models may have some signatures at low energies. And then finally, uh, another aspect, uh, which is uh, what I call quantum dynamics on curved spacetime. So here it's not so much about the quantum nature of gravity per se, but rather about the, the curved nature of gravity or metric aspects of gravity, which affect quantum dynamics and offer new effects. So at high energies, of course, a prime example is Hawking radiation, uh, but there's also interesting low energy phenomena that appear. Um, and you know, Yvette, for example, of course, here in the audience, she works in this field. And in this talk, I want to also uh, focus on this and in particular about one, uh, one kind of line of research uh, that we have started yeah, uh, 10 years ago, namely about how uh, proper time affects uh, uh, quantum matter wave interference. So this will be the, the kind of the main topic of this talk. Uh, so in this talk, um, uh, first I'll uh, introduce this concept of matter wave interferometer in the presence of time relations, something that we call quantum version of the twin paradox. Um, and uh, the main crux there is that uh, kind of the bottom line is that if you include time dilation in the dynamics, it turns out there is an additional entangling operation that is taking place. Uh, and you'll get entanglement between degrees of freedom, which are usually separated, uh, induced by time dilation. And then I'll discuss how that can, in some instances, lead to decoherence of mesoscopic systems. Um, and then finally, uh, some more recent results are on a composite mass uh, coupling to gravity, namely how passive gravitational mass arises uh, in the context of general relativity, which is inspired or directly related to this uh, quantum uh, uh, analysis that, that we did here for this quantum twin paradox. Okay, so uh, one way to study the interface between quantum mechanics and gravity is to look at some possible conceptual differences between these two theories. And so, of course, we know that quantum mechanics is based different fundamental uh, axioms than gravity is. So quantum mechanics is probabilistic inherently. We have uncertainty principle. Importantly, we have unitary time evolution um, and, and other fundamental principles. On the gravity side, we have completely different starting points. The equivalence principle between mass and uh, you know, uh, inertial and gravitational mass, which leads to the notion of some geometry, of space-time geometries so as a geometric theory. You have diffeomorphism invariance in that kind of the coordinates don't play a role. And the uh, gravity leaves, you know, it's a manifold. And then the space time itself is a dynamic degree of freedom, uh, which suggests a type of field theory for it as well. And so it's completely different starting points. And of course, the observable consequences are very different, which we, you know, many of which we have confirmed individually. So, of course, interference, wave particle duality, entanglement, bell inequality violation, and so forth on the quantum side, also high energy phenomena. Um, uh, and on the gravity side, you know, the Newtonian force is the lowest limit, but then you start getting post-Newtonian corrections. So you have, you know, like corrections to how the force behaves. It's not exactly Newtonian. And then you have new phenomena that arise, such as time dilation, which doesn't appear in other theories. And you have interesting concepts like horizons, black holes, uh, you know, strong gravity effects, gravitational waves, and so forth. Um, now, uh, what is possible how to study this uh, interface is by literally looking at the interface of some of these phenomena. And so one example, which has already been experimentally observed and has been proposed uh, nearly 50 years ago, is the interface between particle interference, so matter waves, and uh, how the Newtonian force affects this quantum uh, behavior. 
So in particular, a very kind of uh, standard setup um, is this kind of parameter, which is vertical in the gravitational field. So uh, on a very basic simplistic level, without going into the details of the experiment, you always have a Hamiltonian, which kind of describes your matter wave, and then you place the system into an external gravitational field. So even the homogeneous limit is just mgx, which is the gravitational potential. And now if your wave function is delocalized over different x's, uh, then you'll get a relative phase between these uh, two different amplitudes. And so your effective wave function is max the parameter in the middle is that your superposition of being on two different paths with a relative phase. And this relative phase is precisely coming from this gravitational potential. And it's very small because gravity is extremely weak and that's captured also by mass, you know, being this gravitational charge, very small, but you divide it by h bar. And so this particular observable is very large because you divide it by h bar as opposed to, for example, measuring the gravitational force uh, uh, for such systems. And so this was realized by Colina, Oberhauser, and Ferner nearly 50 years ago, uh, and that you get an observable effect. And so this is real data here where they had such an interferometer. It looks like this. Uh, so it's um, you know, neutrons that they used, called neutrons as matter waves, and then Bragg diffraction from these crystals. And this is literally a few centimeters big. Um, and these are precisely the numbers which give you a couple of uh, phase shifts when you rotate the interferometer as you change this uh, x here. Um, and so uh, the of um, modern technology uh, that uh, do metro does metrology of the gravitational acceleration, such as, for example, atomic fountains that uh, has spread, have a very large spread, even up to a, a close to a meter now, maybe so, so beyond. Um, of uh, such superposition states. And so the bigger your superposition, the better, uh, the bigger your phase shift. And so the better you can actually detect this gravitational acceleration. So it has also a, you know, a practical aspect. So what do we learn from such, uh, such this interface particularly? Um, what we learn is that we can add the gravitational potential uh, just as we would add any other potential into the Schrodinger equation. And on the one hand, it's maybe trivial. On the other hand, at least at that time, there was a lot of speculation that you cannot do that because gravity is different. It's not just simply a potential or force that you just add to it. And there was speculation that this might, you know, not, not just simply not be possible. Uh, but you can do it and you get exactly what you expect. Um, and in particular, you get a quantum effect, which cannot be explained classically. So we're not just talking about, you know, letting an atom fall and it just falls in gravity and it happens to be quantum, it's really an effect which just doesn't appear uh, classically at all. What we don't learn, and that's of course very important, is first of all, we don't learn anything about beyond the Newtonian. Namely, we did the same to, uh, to gravity here, what we would do to any other force. We just added the potential, uh, potential energy to our Hamiltonian. So there's nothing special in this limit. Um, but when you go beyond the Newtonian limit, it, it becomes, more interesting because gravity really starts deviating from any other interaction that we know. And the second aspect, what we don't learn anything about is of course quantization of the gravitational degrees of freedom. Here they're just a fixed background. And so uh, I like that I, I saw the slides for, for, uh, for many years, but now with the modern development with the proposal that has you know, been done by uh, uh, Bose uh, and collaborators that uh, precisely it talks about a modification of this proposal, precisely this type of setup, a small modification to it, namely having two of them, which addresses precisely the second bullet point. Uh, namely that actually an interesting and clever modification can tell us something about the quantization of the degradation of of freedom as well. And uh, in our work, uh, uh, what we did, uh, before, you know, we you know we weren't that clever, and what we did was more looking about this first bullet point, namely about how do you go beyond the Newtonian limit, and what is maybe special about gravity that could enter this type of setup, um, in order to learn something about the metric nature of gravity and also novel quantum effects that arise. And so, in particular, what we focused on uh, was a kind of slightly different over, uh, overlay here of these phenomena, namely, on the one hand, uh, particle interference and entanglement, and on the other hand, this post-Newtonian aspect of gravity, but not just simply any post-Newtonian aspect, in particular, the one which is related to time dilution, because that is really something that uh, separates gravity from all other interactions. Um, and so the time dilation is not just simply a modification to the potential, but rather something conceptually different. And so this is kind of the motivation for um, this line of research, uh, where you really start probing interfaces of quantum mechanics and gravity 
uh, which um, kind of go more at the heart of the kind of fundamental differences of the Okay, and so in a very brief summary of what is happening, uh, that can be done in two slides uh, here. And so if you want to pay attention, that's that's all you need in some sense to, to really understand what's going on on a basic level. So from gravity, what we take is time dilation, namely the gravitational time dilation tells us that if you have two clocks and they're synchronized, and then you place them in two different heights, uh, they will after a while desynchronize. Uh, so clocks closer to the mass tick slower than clocks further away. So that's gravitational time dilation as predicted by GR. Uh, so that's one, one aspect that we take from GR. And from quantum mechanics, uh, what we need is just one other aspect, namely what's called as quantum complementarity. Uh, and quantum complementarity is just a simple statement that if you do a quantum interference experiment, uh, then you do need something like a double slit. So you need a superposition. And then if you interfere the superposition, you see this uh, characteristic interference pattern. Complementarity tells you that if you try to measure which path the system took, so if you try to interact with the system in between and try to distinguish any of these superposition amplitudes, then this interference pattern will be lost. And there's a precise trade-off between how much you know uh, the path and how much interference you can observe. So that's complementarity. So just combining those two without any mathematics uh, tells you already all you need to know about this kind of uh, effect or line of research. Namely, if you, instead of two clocks, if you take a single clock, but then you delocalize it quantum mechanically, such as the one clock is in superposition of being either closer to the mass or further away, then due to gravity, it will take it a different rate, so it will show a different clock time. Uh, but due to quantum complementarity, if you try to interfere them, uh, this interference will be lost precisely to the degree to how much time dilation there is that is accumulated by the clock degrees of freedom. So basically, the basic setup is that you do an interference of clocks that experience different proper times. So you create a single system that's simultaneously in superposition of being uh, young and old. Uh, and the prediction is the, the signature of that is that you have you lose path coherence. So it's both a gravitational or kind of a post-Newtonian effect in that there's time dilation due to gravity. And at the same time, it's a quantum effect because we're talking about how quantum interference is affected. So that's kind of really the, the, uh, the bottom line. Um, but there's, you know, of course, some surprises and interesting effects that happen on the way. Um, okay, so first of all, going back to just clocks and how they measure time dilation. Uh, like I said, uh, clocks closer to the mass take slower than further away. And that is because the proper time is what really every clock is actually measuring. And so the proper time, according to GR, is a function of the metric as well. Velocities too, but also of the metric. And in this kind of first order post-Newtonian expression, it depends directly on the gravitational potential. Uh, over c squared. So it's the redshift factor. Uh, now these clocks themselves could just as well be quantum systems. Uh, so if you have, in fact, nearly all, or maybe even all uh, measurements of the gravitational time dilation have been done with quantum systems. Uh, so you have some atomic clocks, for example, two level systems, and then they take at different rates, at different heights. Uh, in other words, uh, these clocks, even in quantum mechanics, of course, accumulate proper time. And so that's, of course, well known because that's the universality of time dilation. Namely, it doesn't care if you are quantum or, or classical. So in that respect, of course, there is some quantum aspect to all tests of time dilation so far. And so, for example, first demonstrations by half of the Keating, by using the first atomic clock, cesium clocks, uh, and then more recently, or not even that recent anymore, 10 years ago, are these kind of trapped ion clocks, uh, which you know can measure the 30 centimeter high differences. And I think today you can go down to a their scales with uh, precisions of atomic clocks. Uh, but the bottom line is here, the clock mechanism may be quantum mechanical, but uh, what, what is not quantum mechanical is what actually matters for gravity, namely the position. So the clocks are still very well localized. So they have some mechanism that uh, evolves in some way, uh, but wherever gravity acts on the system, that part is still classical. So they're a well localized system. And it's this part that we kind of elevated uh, to being a quantum mechanical degree of freedom as well. Okay, so uh, the idea is to go beyond the Newtonian limit and just to add some math to it, uh, there's many ways to derive how these effects take place. And it's very useful when doing 
quantum optics, like we want to do AMO physics, is to derive a Hamiltonian. And it's less common to work with Hamiltonians in GR, but there's nothing wrong with it either. Uh, you just have to you know, make sure that you, uh, um, you find the right one, at least in an appropriate limit. And so one can start, for example, with the Klein-Gordon equation, um, you know, just for some particle. And then uh, it can even be a more complicated system in that it has also some kind of rest energy of the system as well. Um, and then the Hamiltonian is really the zeroth component of the, uh, of the four momentum. And so that's really a function of coordinates. Uh, it's a function of the metric and of the, uh, of the rest energy here as well. Uh, okay, and okay, one can give an expression for it here for a static metric. Um, but the main point is we're only interested in low energy limits. So even when we want to take post Newtonian corrections, we're only interested in really systems which are AMO systems. So we're not interested in field theory effects, there's no particle creation. We want atoms, molecules, and so forth. So it's perfectly fine to work in the Schrodinger equation because the energies of the systems themselves are, are all in this limit. But there will, of course, be some, uh, some um, uh, 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 corrections. Uh, and in particular, if you are kind of in the rest frame of the system, then, as we said before, you evolve with respect, evolve with respect to proper time. And the second crucial aspect to describe this effect um, and this is why even in this limit that has been well studied, it has not been previously considered, is that here what we need are composite systems. It's not sufficient to just have a single kind of rest mass of your, of your uh, probe particle. What you need is a system that not only has a rest mass, but it has also some local dynamics. Uh, so a two-level system of an atom could be molecules, it could be a, a, just an oscillator, whatever it is, but there has to be some additional dynamics, which is now described by this H, H0. And so that is the crucial aspect, uh, which allows one to, to look at this uh, kind of quantum twin paradox version. And so, okay, one can then derive, uh, just using standard methods, this kind of uh, expansion of the Hamiltonian. And, in fact, there's many different derivations since and more recent ones. Um, but uh, the main point is one over C squared uh, corrections uh, look like that. So you have this regular kinetic energies and uh, gravitational potential. Then you have these corrections, post Newtonian corrections to it with a scale of one over C squared. But then on top of that, you have this crucial new part, which is proportional to H naught and which you don't get if you don't have local dynamics. And this additional part H naught couples to the gravitational potential and to the momentum squared. And in particular, uh, this really is just a reformulation of the fact that proper time is coordinate time times this additional redshift factor, uh, velocity factor. So this is just a Hamiltonian formulation of this very well-known fact. So there's nothing new about it per se. It's just that here we put it in this uh, in this uh, context. So this gives you a coupling between internal and external degrees of freedom. So internal ones are now green and external will be red. And I hope I'm consistent for the rest of the talk, but that's that's the idea here. Um, and so studying the Hamiltonian amounts to studying quantum mechanics on some fixed background classical space time. So there's no, again, no quantum mechanics of the gravity per se, um, but now the space time has post Newtonian corrections. And in particular, it also has time dilation, which you can operationally be measured in your system by measuring evolution with respect to each node. And uh, just for simplicity, uh, just really to zoom in on uh, a simple uh, case, uh, we can just say the velocities don't matter. We forget about, you know, we just look at stationary system, forget about how things are, you know, in, uh, 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 created or so forth. And then we also look even at the homogeneous limit that you don't have to, but just for simplicity. So then this interaction Hamiltonian in the AMO language is H naught coupling to GX over C squared. And the interaction is now between the internal Hilbert space and the position of the center of mass. Okay, and just one example, an alternative derivation without even going through this kind of coordinate equation is starting with the action, which is well known for probe systems, except for now to incorporate this internal degrees of freedom. Instead of mass, you have to start with a overall rest Lagrangian, namely if you sit in the rest with a rest frame of the system, there is still a kind of a, a Lagrangian that governs these relative degrees of freedom. And so that maybe I'll have time in the end to go a little bit about this, uh, talk about this paper where we studied just in general, even classically, uh, passive gravitational mass in GR uh, and how, uh, how to properly describe it, which was surprisingly not only not known, but done interestingly, uh, in an interestingly wrong way. 
Okay, but uh, so for, for now, this is just to say, all we need is just this interaction Hamiltonian. And so now we can just do our, our normal quantum optics and it's quite clear what's happening. So, so in particular, if you have classically this interaction Hamiltonian, uh, then you have this Newtonian gradation potential plus you have this interaction with a, uh, which just is an expression of the gradation redshift. So it just tells you that the clocks tick differently at different heights, what I said before. Uh, but quantum mechanically, you put hats on all the operators. Gold, and, if I may ask uh, you a question regarding your previous slide. As you know, that gravity is a constrained system. And Hamiltonian for gravity is um, quite complicated. I mean, you know, yeah. very well-known uh, general relativists like Bob Wall and even many Gerok and others have spent lives and lives there on de deriving the Hamiltonian. Now, what surprises me is that uh, here you are trying to promote this as a Hamiltonian formulation for gravity. And I don't see where the constraint comes into the system at all. I mean, you're treating yeah. almost no, gravity yeah. as a, like a, a QED, for instance. So would you- No, you're fully right, Anuba. It's an excellent, excellent comment. You're fully right. The clarification here is we do not treat gravity as a dynamical degree of freedom here. Actually, we just fix it. So we just put a pro particle, which is QED particle, whatever it is, just normal, and just place that on a fixed, a kind of fixed pre-given uh, gravitational background. So, so then this problem doesn't arise. So we don't formulate the Hamiltonian for gravity because we don't look at its dynamics. We just say, okay, we fix it. So we make it kind of simpler in that sense. And, and that of course then lacks some of the interesting effects, which could be, you know, what, what about gravity being dynamical or quantum? And so that doesn't come in here, but instead it's, you know, that's why I said it's a little bit similar maybe to kind of QFT on curved space time. You just kind of, you know, Put, put metrics in here, but you don't look at the dynamics. Maybe there's an interesting interplay actually between them at this level too. So, so it's a good comment that things. Okay, uh, right. So what, what I was saying before is that now we put hats on this Hamiltonian just to quantize. Um, and then it's very clear what's happening. Namely this interaction term now entangles your two different uh, Hilbert spaces. So in particular, if you start with a system uh, which has some internal uh, degrees of freedom, which are not eigenstates of H naught, then as it passes through this interferometer, it will evolve differently depending on what X is. And what you get is an entangled state. So if you go on the lower path, uh, then you have this kind of center of mass wave function in, uh, correlated with this uh, uh, internal degrees of freedom being certain state. And if you go on a different path, it's a different state. And so what you get now is conceptually an additional effect, namely you get the entanglement between uh, internal and external degrees of freedom, which is induced by this additional uh, term. So previously the gradational potential here only gave you the phase shift and any, any uh, post-Newtonian corrections of that system, uh, of that uh, 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 potential will also change your phase shift. Uh, but here the time relation effect gives this additional phenomena if and only if you have also clock degrees of freedom, which are not eigenstates of this internal Hamiltonian. Namely, you get an entanglement between these different degrees of freedom. And one signature of that, for example, is you don't even look at the clock at all, and you just try to do your interference experiment as usual. Uh, but what will happen is because of which way information, uh, you have to trace out uh, the clock degrees of freedom. And if they don't perfectly overlap, your interference will be reduced. And so this is this change in visibility depending on how much we train information you obtain. And so a simple example is you can have a two level system for the clock, like an atomic clock, and then you delocalize it as well. And then uh, you'll get a modulation, uh, modification of this interference pattern. And I'll show some numbers in a minute. Okay, and so it's kind of the, the basic, again, the bottom line is, if you look at the phase shift, uh, so usually that's your figure of merit, and you can also look, uh, see post-Newtonian corrections there, but that is always like a potential. It's like a potential theory, so you can always think of it as in terms of some potential with absolute time. Um, and uh, you know, you, for example, you know, some this potential would also arise in electromagnetism, maybe of different form. Uh, whereas if you get this entanglement, um, that arises because you have time dilation, which really couples any arbitrary internal degrees of freedom to uh, your spatial uh, degrees of freedom as well. Uh, Igor, uh, can I ask something? Yeah. So, so this acceleration, the, the, the small g, can it also be due to uh, like something else? Uh, it's, it's equivalent, right? If you, if you rotate the table and stuff, you still get the same effect. 
Yeah, absolutely. You're exactly right. So precisely because we work in this homogeneous limit, the only thing that arises is a small g. And you're exactly right. This small g uh, could be acceleration. Uh, you, you can also have velocity terms even here as well. Uh, and so there's a similar coupling to velocity, which we even put to zero, uh, neglected, just assuming. Uh, but yes, um, exactly right. So if you accelerate the system, for example, you would have the same effect on this level. If you look at the non-homogeneous part, uh, it might not be exactly the same, but it doesn't matter. In the end, it only matters how much proper, how much proper time is different between two different paths. And it could have completely different uh, origins. You, you, you're exactly right. It could have a curvature counterpart of this as well. Yeah, you can. So the curvature for this particular effect does not matter that much, uh, only in the sense that it might change proper time. Uh, and uh, so I, I'll show it just, I think, in the next slide. So the only thing that this effect depends on is the proper time difference. Uh, OK, I'll show, well, OK, so one can see it here. I think in the next slide, I show it. So basically, we here, for a specific system where you have some periodic clock at some periodicity uh, given by omega, uh, then this visibility change depends only on the proper time difference that's accumulated among two paths. And this can have different origins. And sure, if there's curvature, it can also change proper time, but uh, mainly you, you don't need curvature to change proper time. So there could be many different reasons for that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, sure, uh, so it's an excellent point. And why we zoomed in on gravity is because we're precisely interested in somehow that, because gravity also does it. So somehow gravity does change your proper time. And so that is the interesting aspect uh, for us, just kind of to see where this interface lies, but it can just as well be, you know, other origins of proper time, uh, that, or, or you know, usually a combination of all of these. Um, and then you can also generalize these effects. So I think one important aspect is that the effect is universal in the sense that this H naught is not specified. Uh, and in not specifying H naught is very spe special about gravity, uh, um, which means that any arbitrary system that has some kind of non-stationary state or non-eigenstate of the Hamiltonian will be affected. So for example, if you have many periodic clocks and you have a mixture of them, so even though they're in a mixed, maybe stationary state, but you have a, mixed of, a mixture of them, you get these kind of many, many different phase shifts that you average over. So you get this kind of much more rich in general behavior as opposed to this uh, periodic behavior of how your phase shift is modulated. Um, and then you have a similar effect for photons, just for experimental reasons. This is interesting uh, where you include the Shapiro delay instead of the time relation. Okay, uh, but so, and that, that this, this goes to Sugato's question a little bit, just to give like a picture, uh, what, what are we talking about? Um, namely, the visibility is the uh, overlap between how these two different seas evolve. And how the two different seas evolve depends only on proper time. And so kind of the, the idea for these numbers I gave is you have something like a system, you split it in zero position, you neglect the splitting, then you hold them for a really long time of two different heights. Then later you bring them together. <coughs> and then as you bring them together, you get some interference pattern, which is uh, changing. And so this is under this particular metric. And of course, by the equivalence principle, uh, the same metric is of course exactly the same as for accelerating systems, if you're in a homogeneous limit. And so it's equivalent to these word lines, for example. Uh, so you have the same effect. Um, and completely generally, the, the formula for this visibility depends only on these two things, the Hamiltonian of the internal states and the proper time difference of your two paths. So they have to be closed paths uh, with which you interfere. And if you have a proper time difference and you're not an energy eigenstate, you'll see an effect. And otherwise you don't. And so this is very generic. It has you know, nothing to do with the particular metric one chooses or, 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 or state. Okay, uh, so, so this is kind of the basic effect that appears. Um, and uh, the, the interesting thing is also, it is kind of close to be a, being accessible in Earth-based experiments. So for example, if one takes two level system as the simplest example, uh, and for example, one takes atoms. So one can look through any different systems, but for example, it takes atoms because what matters is the frequency and they have optical states, which is the highest frequency at which they take, uh, then what matters is how much can you separate the systems in superposition and how long can you keep the superposition? And it's about one to two orders of magnitude away from current experiments. And so hopefully next generation uh, atomic fountains will be able to pick it up if they have the right geometry for it, such that you have a, a different property. 
And so the, the signature would be that you have first a loss of your visibility and then a revival. Uh, and that's because of this periodic behavior. The loss happens when your two clock states are precisely orthogonal. And then you have a revival is when the proper time is so much the difference that your, you know, your clock at a, at a, at a higher um, uh, altitude had you know, time to evolve a full period more than the lower one. Uh, and in particular, this has been observed in an analog system, uh, namely in like an electromagnetic analog where the difference in time evolution was imposed by inhomogeneous magnetic fields for a specific spin uh, where a clock was implemented in spin TV. Okay, and so this is what I mentioned. This was kind of an analog system. There are some proposals to do it maybe with photons in space. That that's probably still difficult. And then what's interesting is you know these maybe hundred meter fountains which will create ten meters of positions, uh, but also this new geometry that's been explored in Holger Müller's group where uh, you have really twenty seconds holding time, uh, but currently pretty small superposition sizes. So these experiments are pushing in this direction. And why I think it's very interesting to probe or, or verify something like this effect is because we have not a single experimental um, evidence of quantum mechanics on curved spacetime or post-Newtonian metric in any way. And so that would really be a first push into a, a new regime of physics where quantum mechanics has to be probed. And also gravity has to be probed because now we're talking about uh, quantum effects there. So we never went beyond the Newtonian limit for gravity in the quantum domain. Um, okay, so hopefully, you know, my hope is, you know, maybe within the next 10 years, that should be possible to observe something like that. Uh, okay, and a bit more conceptually, it opens another route for something which is known as the quantum classical transition. Namely, uh, there is... So you mentioned that uh, you are probing also the post-Newtonian uh, correction. So this is the part I didn't yeah. understand. Uh, why do you claim this? Yeah, absolutely. Part? Because it depends on one over c squared. So these are post-Newtonian corrections here uh, that enter. Like this, this term is a post-Newtonian term. It's one of c squared suppressed. So, because if I uh, if I say say for instance if I take a Schwarzschild metric, so then uh, I get one minus two gm over r c squared as well. That's yeah. The potential and the post-Newtonian correction in a general relativistic sense will be. Uh, you know, even higher order terms like R, one over R square or one over R cube, and then the H bar will come. So those are the conventionally known as the post-Newtonian correction. Yeah. Well, well, it depends on the signature. So usually you need one higher order because you multiply it by MC squared. So you lose one C squared factor uh, where, you know, even to get, to get this Newtonian part, you need, well, you know, uh, you need the Schwarzschild metric to, to first order. Uh, but to get this additional time dilation part, uh, that is, uh, you know, that is a prime example actually of the first post-Newtonian effect uh, that appears as even a classic test of GR. But I, so classic I, test of GR is test of time dilation or the redshift, uh, and so in that sense, it's you know one of these. I claim that these terms effects. are not uh, is a gauge dependent terms. These are not gauge invariant terms. These can be removed by choice of different gauge, different coordinate system, you can remove this. Yeah, you, you can have it in accelerated frame as well. That's right. But uh, in terms of just, you know, in terms of just normal GR nomenclature, if you no, accept that, that these are angulation. Not gauge terms. I'm saying that these are not gauge invariant. I can remove these terms in a particular choice of coordinate, coordinate system. So yeah, but you don't, you don't remove the uh, effect. Uh, so you can never remove the effect. So, so, so H, so all Hamiltonians are of course gauge dependent because there's a coordinate uh, evolution with respect to specific coordinate. But the effect here is in the end that it only depends on proper time. So here, for example, uh, uh, da, 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 here. So this 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 um, expression you cannot remove by a different gauge. Uh, so you have uh, you have you know. It only depends on proper time, so that that will always be the case. So if the proper time is different, then the effect appears. If it's not different, then it doesn't appear. Okay. But the pro but the proper time difference could also, of course, be special relativistic. So there's no you know no problem there. But um, but in this picture, it's easier to see. Okay. Thanks. Right. Sure. Sure. Sorry, I have also a question. Can I? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, in the astrophysical uh, sources, you, uh, they are masers. I wonder if uh, 
uh, have anybody try to use uh, these masers uh, because because they they are they are really coherent uh, photons uh, to to see if uh, uh, any effect of uh, gravitation can, or dilatation can be can be detected because some of them uh, so, okay they they come usually from uh, molecular clouds it, uh, they, there is probably uh, not a very uh, strong uh, gravitational uh, field there but they can be if they come from other galaxies they they they, they can be lensed by by uh, another galaxy for instance and then the effect should be probably testable so there are some effects of GR, I think, of course, that when you look at light stemming from or, or amazing from different galaxies that can happen, like lensing and so forth. But, but here we're zooming in just on a very specific effect, which you only see if you have two conditions, namely you have a superposition, and then you have also a local system that can uh, keep track of time. And so, you know, you would have to have an interferometer and also something locally uh, keeping track of time. If you just look at light, uh, then it doesn't keep locally track of time because proper time for light is always zero. Uh, so you would, you know, you would need to think about how that works. But then also have quantum interference of it. Uh, Usually, so variation should be should be uh, uh, because this the, the signal uh, has uh, inherent variation. Probably the variation should can be used to uh, as a, as as a sort of clock to see how, uh, how... But if it goes through empty space, kind of um, photon can never be a clock. Uh, I mean, of course it depends, you know, you can build some clock out of a photon, but just by itself, it will not, it will not know a proper time. So because here the effect only kicks in if you have two different paths and they experience different proper times. So by, you know, the short answer is, I, I don't see how naively, but probably, you know, maybe in some, clever way there could be some way to maybe construct some type yeah. of clock and interferometer with these systems, but not just by themselves because, you know, they, yeah, yeah. Sure. Of, course, of course, of course, there's other GR effects. So this is not to say, you know, it's the only one and so forth. It's kind of more zooming in that there is kind of a one that happens, which, which, which results in entanglement. So there has to be entanglement between specific degrees of freedom. That, that Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, if there's more questions, please uh, feel free. Otherwise, I shift gears a little bit. Uh, so, so a related subject and now less experimentally relevant, but more uh, direct consequences of what, of what I uh, discussed is this uh, relevance for this uh, quantum to classical transition in the following sense that there's two main competing discussions about how the quantum to classical transition takes place. Within quantum mechanics, it's usually explained as decoherence. Uh, namely, whenever we have quantum effects, but you interact with a larger system, and so forth, such as the interaction with phonons, gas, photons, and so forth, even gravitons. Uh, so, in fact, I think, yeah, uh, Marco and Anupam, and even Suga, I, I think you three had like a recent paper on also uh, decoherence due to gravitons or gravitational waves in general. Uh, so, so there is a very interesting interface there uh, with quantum mechanics and gravity. And so uh, in the classical, quantum to classical transition, gravity could play a role, but it's all within, in this context, within quantum mechanics. Then there is a second speculative uh, uh, suggestion, which is maybe there is some kind of breakdown of quantum mechanics, which also explains why the classical world arises. And, and so a typical example is Penrose's gravitational collapse or by Tioshi. And so the idea there is that really there is some kind of fundamental limit in terms of scale of where, um, uh, quantum mechanics is valid, and it's often tied to where gravity starts kicking in or cell gravity of the system. And so a little bit in this context, there is some uh, a new mechanism that stems from this time dilation effect. Uh, and so, okay, so like I said, one is modification of quantum theory, that's a known thing, and it's not related in any way to scattering with gravitons or other things. And others within quantum theory are, and related to gravity, one is gravitational waves, uh, and the other is uh, the one that I'll discuss here just in one slide or two, namely that time dilation can also effectively give you uh, effective transitional classicality for arbitrarily mesoscopic systems. Uh, namely, it's the same principle as we discussed before, now putting it a bit more to the extreme. Like I said, this time relation effect is universal in the sense that it affects any 
uh, system as long as it's not in an eigenstate of its internal Hamiltonian. So one example is we can take a large system, so it has n degrees of freedom, not just one clock state, but really many n, where it could be Avogadro number or so. Then you don't even control the internal state, so you never initialize any clock states that you want them to tick. So you don't even know how to read out time with them, but you just have this many degrees of freedom, and there's even no coherence, so it could be like some kind of thermal state of these constituents. So kind of a mental picture, for example, is some kind of complex molecule like that, which this one actually has been observed to interfere in Marcos arms experiments. And then it's created in some uh, superposition at, along different heights. And what happens is that, uh, again, because of gradual time dilation, uh, whenever you have some kind of vibrations of the system, they will be different if the system is closer to the mass than if it's further away. So you have these local vibrations which uh, change their frequencies. And effectively, what this, in other words, the same thing, the same thing is that your system, your n internal uh, degrees of freedom, will actually couple even if they're uh, uh, thermal states, they will still couple uh, to your center of mass uh, in degrees of freedom through this effective interaction Hamiltonian. And so just to give a basic example, um, which uh, uh, is just an example of how these things can arise, for, uh, take n harmonic modes of a system uh, and then place the center of mass of the system at two different heights initially. So you create a superposition state of the center of mass. So you assume you are initially in this product state between the center of mass and all your relative degrees of freedom that you don't care about. Uh, but then you subject it to gravity. Uh, namely, you have this Hamiltonian, which doesn't just give you phase shifts, but it also gives you this coupling. Namely, your internal thermal oscillations are also slowed down. If it's closer to the mass, then it's further away. And from that alone, what you get is you can uh, then compute what the visibility is of this uh, coherence, so just the off diagonal elements of this uh, superposition, uh, tracing out the internal states. And one can see that it effectively decays in some uh, Gaussian decay with a characteristic time scale. And this characteristic time scale depends on how many modes you have. And then the rest is temperature, superposition size, and you know, a, a lot of kind of fundamental constants that enter. And so uh, one can do the same in a, you know, in a master equation approach, but I see I'm kind of running out of time. So just very briefly, one can now do the same analysis just from an open system uh, mindset and perspective. So we have some center of mass uh, degrees of freedom and then a broader bath where the bath are just relative degrees of freedom. And you have this overall interaction Hamiltonian where this gamma factor is due to this um, redshift factors. Um, and then what you can find is you can find this reduced uh, equation of motion for the reduced density matrix for the center of mass. And then you have a unitary part here. Uh, and uh, you can then you have a non-unitary part, which is uh, quite complicated. And if you can, you can uh, approximate it uh, just by assuming you have only gravity and you neglect this kind of slow build up of the superposition. And what, what one sees is that in this unitary part, your mass just effectively gets renormalized by the average internal energy. And in Einstein's words, what this really says is just this a very simple known fact is that a piece of iron weighs more when red hot than when cool. So if you have thermal energy that will contribute to your overall gravitational mass of the system. But then you get this additional purely quantum mechanical effect, uh, which is this double commutator structure. Namely, you get the coherence uh, uh, or the phasing into this position basis of the system, which scales as the, uh, uh, as the fluctuations in the internal energy of the system. So if you have fluctuations of the internal energy, then you'll get this kind of decoherence into the position basis, which is also what you want in the quantum to classical transition. So you obtain from that, again, the same characteristic time scale as I showed before, now kind of more from a mass equation approach. And so one aspect here is there's no dissipation per se. And so there's nothing kind of leaking out away or that is fundamentally gone. It's just that you have a lot of information or, or a lot of correlations available with your relative degrees of freedom. And if you have many relative degrees of freedom, only then, of course, but if you have many, then it's effectively a bath that you never have a recurrence uh, if it's just you know too many of them with different frequencies. And there you don't have an external environment, but of course, quantum mechanically, of course, you just have two separate Hilbert spaces. So of course, it's external in that sense. It's fully unitary. It's, there's nothing special going on here. But uh, conceptually, you have like one composite system and its center of mass would decohere uh, because the relative degrees of freedom uh, would evolve differently. 
It, and it, so, yeah. Sorry, can you remind me why you have this this uh, delta H note? Uh, sorry, I, 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 I'm sure you, you explained it, but. Yeah, uh, well, so that's what appears when you look at the, um, when you solve this master equation. So you coupling to this H naught, uh, Bruno's interaction Hamiltonian, and then in this context here, for example, you do a Born approximation, so the first order, uh, and then what uh, what you end up with is uh, just the delta H naught, which uh, enters in this um, uh, as the prefactor. Uh, Maybe to link it to what before I said, remember there was a frequency, the frequency of the oscillations. Okay. So that was actually this delta H naught. It was just, what is the difference? What's the variance between your two energy states that you're populating? So variance energy uh, of the energy of populating? Yeah, the, int the variance of the internal energy. So the H naught is only the internal energy. Okay. Uh, so for example, you know, the, let's say again, a single system atomic clock, then the variance would be between these two states that you're populating. Uh, of the, this is with respect to the uh, you know initial state. Okay, right. Uh, so if you are in an energy eigenstate, this factor is exactly zero. Uh, but if you have uh, mixtures of different states, then that that that's what enters to lowest order in the kind of coupling. And, and, approximation. and earlier, did you mention that uh, the uh, entanglement of the internal uh, degrees uh, plays a role here? Yeah, uh, so if, you're, if your internal systems are, for example, fully mixed, okay, uh, yeah. it's similar, it's similar as another decoherence mod. So let's say you have two oscillators um, oh. and you trace one out, you entangle, and that's why you lose coherence. If you have one oscillator and a huge bath of many and they're thermal, you don't generate entanglement necessarily, yeah. uh, but any, the correlations are sufficient to decohere your system. So, so in this case, if it's thermal bath perfectly and very big, and you don't generate entanglement with the system. Okay. But you kind of, as in other degree, you know, if you have many, you, your correlations are just you hear your system. And if it's an initially pure state, yes, then it will just be entangled. Okay, right. Okay, uh, so, and then just to mention numbers for this. So I, yeah, it was a, you know, for me, it was a bit surprising effect uh, that it takes place on a relatively short time scales, not necessarily relevant experimentally, but um, if you take an example, just some kind of micrometer scale object, so like a small or you know large molecule or a microsphere or something, uh, and it has room temperature, and you can create a pretty big superposition for quantum mechanics, but you know it's on scales compared to time dilation is pretty small, so like a millimeter, then you also get on you know the millisecond type uh, uh, a range of decoherence time scale, so. In, it means that mesoscopic systems, composite systems, uh, you could hear even in the presence of kind of very weak time dilation on Earth, uh, kind of by themselves. So even if it was an empty universe, but you have a background space time, it would be able to delocalize very much uh, if there is time dilation uh, there. And, and so it's, uh, it's not in any way related to this kind of collapse mechanisms, which really is a breakdown of unitarity. This is fully unitary. Uh, but it's a little bit different than the scattering ideas of some of the idea of an external environment. Here, your environment, you carry your environment with you in some sense. And it's just the time dilation that scrambles all the relative phases. Sorry, a question. Yeah. Uh, how uh, this uh, uh, decorrence time that you, uh, you give here depends on the strength uh, of your gravitational force? Uh, for yeah. which, uh, uh, I mean, field, gravitational field, uh, have you? calculated this? Yeah, so this is on Earth, so uh, nine point, you know, so the gravitational acceleration comes in here, uh, and that's, you know, nine. On the surface 81. of Earth. Huh? Yeah, on the surface of Earth, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So so if you have it in some, yeah, you can have, of course, much higher accelerations uh, or gravitational fields, or, or even just, you know, velocities. So there it would kick in sooner. Sure, thank you. Yeah, and, and just here, here, this plot is just to give some, uh, kind of transition between this this red line is the visibility for a single clock, which was this kind of uh, modulation where you have this uh, loss and revival of coherence. And then as soon as you start adding more and more internal degrees of freedom with uh, different uh, frequencies, then effectively, you know, there's a much more complicated behavior in between, but after, you know, adding 10 or so, or even more, I mean, depending on 
what, what you choose, then with random frequencies, you basically get like a loss of coherence. And, you know, there's always some revival time due to Poincaré time, but that's true for all coherence. And, you know, if you have sufficiently large system, it basically uh, loses uh, coherence. Okay, uh, right. And so now I think I'm coming uh, to the end of the talk. So I'll, I, I won't, I, I think I'll just summarize this very briefly in the end. Uh, okay, just a second. My, uh, my daughter is here. All right, so uh, um, just to uh, yeah, say a few words, basically all what we discussed depends on how does gravity couple uh, to composite systems. Uh, and in particular, here it couples in such a way that it's the, uh, that it's the um, total energy which matters for the system. Um, and uh, uh, this also relates to this mass energy equivalence, namely, and if the total mass that couples to gravity depends on the total energy of the system, and this is this H naught here in our case. Um, so it turns out that it, it, there is actually, in, if you look at the GR literature, there was actually a little bit of a different result, which depends that the, which says that the mass which couples to gravity is actually a different combination. It's not the total internal energy, but has some different uh, parts of the kinetic and potential energies. Um, and uh, this, it's a bit strange because it kind of violates the mass energy equivalence. Um, so this total gravitational mass is not the same as the total energy seemingly. Um, and also it couples differently to different forms of energy. And so these old results were a bit puzzling and uh, people, uh, so I just very briefly mentioned it, uh, people uh, corrected it, not corrected, but they solved the problem by taking the virial theorem. So if you average the gravitational mass as it couples in the GR setting, so. Here it's just a composite system. You model this and, and you know n particle system, and then you define the total energy and total mass. But then if you take the average, and then this normal behavior is restored because you know twice kinetic energy uh, precisely cancels one potential energy in the gravitational system. But um, when we look at it, uh, you know it's not sufficient, of course, to look at the ensemble if you talk about quantum mechanics. And so there's actually a different resolution. Uh, I want to just briefly mention, namely, it is how do you actually define total energy of a system? And to do that properly, uh, you have to look at the local degrees of freedom of the system when you're sitting in the center of mass um, uh, uh, frame. So when you do that, uh, uh, we have to be careful that you include also this proper redshift factors that define relative distances of your uh, systems uh, and relative velocities of them. And so when you do that, you have to define a, a kind of a correct local energy, uh, total energy. And, and doing that restores actually the problem uh, or resolves the problem. So the, the total gravitational mass of the system is not this combination as they wrote, but instead it's just the total local energy uh, that you define when you sit on the, uh, on the center of mass uh, frame of the system. And so anyway, this is just kind of a, a brief summary of that. Uh, and one, one way to see it is to look at the action for a very arbitrarily kind of composite system where you have n particles that interact with each other in the presence of a background gravitational field. And from that, uh, one can have a very generic construction where you find some local uh, Lagrangian and then a word line on which you fix your system. And from that, you can derive a, a general Hamiltonian for this composite system, which uh, kind of, in some sense, derives the mass energy equivalence. Namely, it's the same Hamiltonian as for a single system with mass m, but now the m is the uh, replaced by the total local energy of the system, which is defined as the Lagrangian transform of this local uh, Lagrangian. Okay, but with that, um, Right, so this was this, uh, which we just described with my collaborators uh, uh, recently. And this is, you know, more generic theoretical result. And we wanted just to square our results and our coupling Hamiltonian to what seemed to be uh, different in the literature. And it turns out, that, you know, it's, uh, it's actually the correct mass energy that, that should appear here. And another result, I, you know, I, 
I, I only briefly mention is uh, one can also look at the Morgan Duncan experiment, including uh, proper time and time dilation, where one now also places the masses in superposition. So that's not experimentally relevant, but it's just to show that you can create a scenario where you can effectively create a bell inequality violations, even though you started with a product state of the system, only by changing the timing of how operations are performed by uh, changing gravity. So you perform operations and then by placing gravitational masses near your systems in superposition, you change the timing and thus you can violate those inequality, which only are violated because you have uh, kind of a, a quantum nature of the temporal order uh, induced by gravity. Okay, and so that's a more recent also theoretical result. But anyway, with that, I want, you know, again, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, and the summary here is, uh, there is this kind of interesting aspect of time dilation, quantum matter wave interference, um, and it induces uh, entanglement of different degrees of freedom uh, when one has this kind of nested interferometry. So one has clocks, uh, and interference as well of the spatial degrees of freedom. And this is a way to probe some of this um, uh, post-Newtonian uh, aspects of GR uh, or of gravity in the quantum domain, which goes beyond uh, the current, uh, current limits. And, uh, you know, one, one consequence is there's also some decoherence mechanism that arises, uh, but hopefully this can be also confirmed in, in, in just near future experiments. Okay, and with that, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Igor. Thanks for a very interesting talk and uh, many, many uh, interesting avenues have come up uh, for discussion. So um, please, um, from the audience, if, uh, if you have any question for Igor, please. So, so Igor, maybe uh, can I ask one question? Uh, so, uh, so you, in the thermal, so the thermal state that you take, okay, so usually a thermal state is a, a mixture of uh, eigenstates of a system, right? So, so normally if you let a system relax, it would come to um, a situation where only eigenstates of the H0 are there, right? A mixed in a, in a thermal proportion. Yeah. Right? Um, so uh, then the delta H0, right? is uh, should not be there right uh, in in the in, in the sense that there should be no time no time dynamics right if you're starting from an eigenstate right? uh, no but you have that's the thing that you still have you you're exactly right uh, it's a mixture of energy eigenstates but the mixture is sufficient to give you a delta h naught uh, so the delta h naught is in fact um, you know for a thermal state it's like a kbt or something like that or uh, three yes yeah. so, so i i, I said i i accept there's still a delta h naught but uh, the in the who the thermal the thermal state is is an eigenstate of h naught yeah. So it's not an eigenstate, but it's a mixture of eigenstates, right? And so, so you're exactly right. It's a little tricky. So there's two ways of seeing it. Maybe I can explain uh, two different. So one way, let's say you write the thermal state as uh, a mixture of coherent states. Mm -hmm. uh, then the picture kicks in that each coherent state, uh, you know, evolves with a slightly different frequency uh, because of time dilation. So the coherent state, you know, under the Hamiltonian, it evolves with a frequency, but it gets time dilated. So that's one picture. Another picture is in terms of energy eigenstates. You're exactly right. Each energy eigenstate uh, is stationary, so nothing happens. But what's happening is that, that each energy eigenstate has an effectively different mass because it's in a different energy eigenstate. And what you get is usually for a single particle or single energy eigenstate, it's just a global phase, like a mass, total mass, doesn't matter. Uh, but here, if you have a mixture of them, you get a mixture of different um, mass phases. So, so if you think of the cow phase, so the Collet overhauser burner phase, you know, that's an MGH over, uh, or MGX T over H bar. Mm. But now you have a mixture of different M's. So you can think of it as a mixture of different phases because each energy eigenstate gives you one such uh, phase and then you mix the many of them. So in other words, if you have a thermal state, a different, a different, uh, uh, th uh, thermal uh, energy eigenstates uh, are differently heavy. Hmm. And this phase still shows, do you, do you have the Ket bra kind of situation, right? This phase. Right, so the mixture of it, right. So the mixture of these different phases then shows. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So you can think of it, let's say I do a, let's say I do a cow experiment. Uh, so I call it overhauser, and then I see a certain relative phase. And then now I do a next one and I do it with a different mass. Slightly different. So I get a slightly different phase shift. And then another oh, one. Okay. And as I do it with a thermal state, I kind of mixing it uh, thermally in some sense. Okay. Okay. So that's, I think that's for me the best picture to think of it. Because you're exactly right. I was, you know, that's, uh, I was wondering about it as well. Uh, so I think in the coherent state basis, it's clear with the um, clock states, and in the energy basis, I think it's more clear in this um, in this uh, mass mixture. I'm a bit confused right. because this is a classical phase. A classical phase will not mix with your uh, will not depend on the choice of your co uh, quantum state whether you take. Hey, I mean, so there is a class. Uh, what I mean is the quantum, the quantum relative phase. Actually, I meant you know this cow phase is the relative phase between the superposition. But it's a classical phase. It's nothing to do with the quantum phase. Which uh, cow phase is a purely a classical phase. Uh, no, but I mean for a for a quantum matter wave superposition. It's a classical phase. It has no quantum mechanics whatsoever. It's just what the, of the, I mean, cow phase, when I say classical phase means gravity is purely classical here. It's just yeah, yeah, gravity, exactly. Gravity is purely classical. You're exactly right. So, so yes, the gravity part is classical. The quantum part is only on the pro particle. So the phase, it's not that the phase measures quantum gravity. It's more that it's a, it's a quantum phase induced on the wave function. So it's quantum in the sense, it's only in that sense I talk about quantum here, uh, that you're, uh, it doesn't arise for a classical probe system but a delocalized matter wave will have a, this phase that arises. But on the gravity part, ex exactly right, yes, yes, yes. And that's the main difference really to like your proposal. Uh, and really it's a different avenue. It doesn't in any way, like what we're proposing cannot test any of these things that uh, for example, you guys propose precisely because on the gravity part, everything just remains classical and not even clear how to make it, you know, uh, not. So, so it's kind of a different aspect. Um, but yes, uh, yeah, uh, the, the quantum aspect is just on the pro-particle level, not on the gravitational level. But this is, this is definitely one more reason to cool our systems to 1K or something like that, you know, because, uh, we, you know, we, we, we generally justify the cooling through other decoherences, but your decoherence will also kick in unless we are in the... Well, like that's, the yeah. ...proposal the experiment with, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, but but I think for your systems it will not yet kick in. I think this decoherence is even 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 weaker. Uh, so by weekend, you're taking so n is the number of particles, right? It's one by so what is the size you need for this this millisecond? Uh, so I think it's something like ten to the uh, you know ten to the twenty particles, something like that. So quite many, and then also vertically, you know, okay, what well, a millimeter, but something like that, and room temperature. Okay, yeah. okay. So so it, you know. It gets closer to your experiment, but I think it's still further away. But it's a good question. I had an estimate at some point, just out of curiosity. And then I always kept it, you know, I thought that's a nice little bachelor project to kind of like quickly calculate one the other and get exposure about, you know, different ideas. That's but uh, so I don't know the numbers exactly, but, um, you know, you have, um, you know, uh, much more real things to worry about. I think for us, it was, or for me, it was less the fact what numbers come out, except for in the GR setting, because I expect, you know, I thought, okay, it takes place and maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe it's like age of the universe because it's really, you know, time dilation is so irrelevant. It's just kind of here, you have so many of these phases scramble, it's faster than, you know, I, I assume. So it's an interesting conceptual thing, I think, but practically it's, you know, uh, maybe, maybe one day. I ask here in this context, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit confused now. That's why I'm asking this question. Sure, sure. So, from quantum field theory perspective, what will be the vertex? You have a matter going on, matter, you're taking the matter to be um, in a ground state. And, uh, initially, matter is in a ground state in your case. It, it can be, yeah, let's say it can be, okay. but there's no vertex with gravity, I think. So I, I don't know, I'm not an expert, but how I would put it is if I take quantum field theory and I kind of, you know, do minimal coupling to it. I then put it on a difference. You see, this is this is what I'm saying. If the matter is in a ground state initially, finally the matter is in a ground state, then mm. this is not a Feynman diagram. So matter matter cannot uh, go into graviton. So if this is not a diagram, right. 
So there's no graviton submitted, right? So the decoherence is not due to graviton emission. Uh, that can also happen, but in this case, you know, that's neglected. Uh, so the decoherence is really because you're starting to couple a different matter degrees of freedom to each other, which is only induced by gravity. So gravity here is passive. Uh, what gravity does is it couples your different uh, degrees of freedom understand. to each other. I don't understand from quantum field theory. May I make a comment? Yeah. Huh? In answer, uh, yeah, you can compare it with, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a magnetic field. A magnetic field, we know that it is quantum, but when we the, we put it in, a, for instance, a, the, the um, Schrodinger equation, we consider it as a classical field. It is very similar. Not really. You can treat magnetic field in a, I mean, you know, QED. QED is a highly quantum system. Yes, but you don't, you don't consider it uh, usually photon by photon, because uh, because uh, uh, unless you go to completely uh, a nonlinear, uh, the QED uh, highly linear is not manner. Otherwise, you can you you consider it uh, only as a, an external classical field. Vorik, uh, if I may say, QED is a linear theory and. Uh, QED is uh, you can um, you can do everything whatever you can do in quantum mechanics you can do in QED just you have to take the right yes, perturbatively perturbatively but uh, uh, when it is not perturbative then uh, you are not in the perturbative regime the mechanics which we are doing is a perturbative regime we are not proving non perturbative regime in quantum mechanics here in any of the experiments but I think she's right in the sense that let's say the analogy, at least one analogy would be, uh, okay, if you have a B field and it couples, for example, inhomogeneous, like the simulator was an inhomogeneous B field, it couples position to spin. And so it only serves as the mediator in some sense. What, are you, uh, so, what will be the mediator? Uh, the B field. So, you know, you have like B of X in the Hamiltonian, you have like B of X times Sigma, for example. And, you know, B is different because it's inhomogeneous. Um, and so now it couples X to Sigma. Yeah, but and that's so it kind of made... students relativistic quantum mechanics and QED from QED to relativistic. Right, you can, exactly, you can, you can get it down, yeah. So you sure. can get down the Feynman yeah. diagram. So my, my yeah. question is what would be the Feynman diagram here? For, yeah, uh, it's a good question. I So, okay, put it this way. This should be possible here because it's also in this kind of weak gravity limit where you can describe it also um, in the in the language you are saying it, it, it's possible and this would be some type of aspect of it and I don't have a good answer yeah it's a good question uh, because here you know it's um it's not like a, that's what I'm trying to stress it's not a potential you know it's it's one of these kind of time dilation effects but of course in the weak limit we can have like a, just a good uh, quantized uh, linearized kind of field theory for it what I'm saying uh, you should check yeah. it these are all gauge dependent terms this, they will all yeah, go yeah. away. If you do it in a properly, in a gauge invariant formulation, none of these terms will survive. No, but the final final result will not uh, go away, of course. I mean, let's say the final result is just time dilation. Like, you know, just as you have two clocks at different heights, you know, that doesn't go away. Like, they will always tick differently. It, it It's gauge independent because it depends on proper time. And the proper time, you know, it doesn't matter which coordinates you use in the end. Uh, so, so my Hamiltonian formulation will be more complicated. Where the mistake would be, it will be GX. You see that uh, uh, any theory, you pick up any theory, yeah. Newtonian mechanics or whatever, you will never get an interaction term which depends only on all terms in X. Sure, but this GX is only in this Hamiltonian limit that appears. If you do the full, you don't have to, you know, you can do it just well in a Feynman diagram and then it will look differently for sure. But, but I only used it to derive this final expression which depends on the proper time in the end. Maybe, yeah, so maybe it would be good yeah. to yeah. do the same calculation. I, I think you're right because the question comes up often in terms of like, how do you see it from different? So that's why, for example, we did this action uh, where, you know, the action is, you know, empty tau, for example. And so the effect appears from there if you have not a single M, but several of them. And so I think that's one of the answers where it appears, and you're right, it doesn't look like GX, although you know it comes at some level, but um, the final answer looks a bit different. But your question is even deeper in terms of how would you do like, you know, loop diagrams of uh, gravity? Yeah, I, I, I don't have a good answer. Diagrams. So yeah, I'm, yeah, my point yeah. is that even at the tree level diagrams, I don't see how one could get it. But anyway, no, but, we can discuss but this it. Is also present in a rotating table, so. So uh, yeah, uh, there is actually a proposal. It's okay, you're, you're spot on because there's a proposal even of um, 
to do it uh, experiment on a rotating table, uh, like super rotating table with big accelerations. And there's I didn't cite it here, but maybe, there's a proposal. Uh, Yvette has raised hands for a while, yeah. So maybe yeah, she has some questions. So, so yes, um, I don't know how. Maybe I I I should uh, pose where where I I find the confusion from my side is that. Um, when you're like starting to learn how to bring together quantum mechanics and general relativity, the first thing you find is that it's full of inconsistencies, and um, you you and and I would like to understand better how those inconsistencies are resolved in this case. And for example, uh, you take your your um, wave function of your of your system, and then uh, you uh, will need that the inner products are Lorentz invariant because now you are in a curved space time, and you know you have that uh, time flows diff at different rates at different points and all of that. So in order to have a consistency, you need that your inner products are Lorentz invariant. But if you impose that your inner products are Lorentz invariant, then you get negative uh, probabilities. And how quantum field theory in curved space-time solves this problem is by saying, okay, you can't have a one, put a hat and have a one theory, uh, um, a one particle theory, you need to move to fields. And that's when you then get that the, the solution is to have a operator value field and you would decompose into, you need to have a time like killing vector field so that you can decompose the solutions to your equations into positive frequency and negative frequency, and then you can quantize. So you seem to have gone like around this whole thing and have something to that works. But I don't understand how you solve all of these like deep, problems that you usually get when you put together the theories. Maybe that's a way to, <laughs> that I would pose. Sure, no, it's, it's a good question and it's not solved in any way, of course, it's just circumvented here. Like they don't arise in the limit we particularly consider. Uh, so it's kind of, that's why it's kind of the weak field limit and the low energy uh, system limit where, uh, you know, you can start, for example, with a clank Warren equation, look at only the positive frequency solutions. You minimally couple it to gravity. So all of it is just a standard thing that you just minimally couple it to gravity and so forth. And there's still, you know, if you push it to a limit, it will always be uh, some, some issues, but you can, you know, you can of course minimally couple it and you know how, how gravity will affect it. If you start getting back action and so forth, it gets complicated, but we're not in a limit where, you know, these things are just neglected because you don't have, uh, you know, uh, your my pro particles don't source any gravity, and so that's why these issues yeah, that arise. Quantum, quantum field theory in curved space time is also in the low energy uh, limit where right. there's no back reaction. No, and exactly. already at that, uh, you you have all the, all those all those problems. I mean, you, right. quantum field theory in curved space time solves them by saying uh, we're we're talking about uh, fields, not single particles and you know you can um, um, let's say you need to have the the low energy uh, thing and and so on but you you can't um, I, 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 you, you, you can't really apply it easily to single particles in a superposition at two different positions. But, but it works fine in this limit just because you know these all these where the problems arise are kind of in a different physical uh, regime. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's true, you know, you can't push this formalism uh, all, all the way up, but you can have a one of a C squared expansion in terms of your interactions. And there's like a well-defined procedure to do that. Uh, you know, I mean, you can think of um, uh, gravity electromagnetism and you kind of, you know, do this perturbatively. Uh, and there's, there's some follow-up papers that do this also a bit more uh, kind of uh, mathematically structured uh, by some, and so you, you know, you basically start with some field theory and then you, you know, you define a Hamiltonian like, like we did in this uh, uh, action. But the long story short is that you're of course right, but these, you know, that, you know, in this regime, these issues just simply don't uh, kick in yet. And so we don't solve them in any way. It's not anything even new. It's uh, really just to, uh, you know, uh, just to show that in this regime, there's new effects that arise, but you're not yet there where you have to worry about I don't know, infinities or, or, or some other issues that come. I think Igor, if uh, I think Yves' point is very important. So I think the best approach to do any of these problems will be to go uh, uh, in the field theory limit, 
then take an appropriate non relativistic limit and see what terms survive, what terms but, don't. Survive. But this has all been done. You're exactly right, but this has all been done. So that's exactly done. right. And so yeah. the point is that none of the terms which you pointed out, they exist in, 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 in when you do this post Newtonian. But that's not true. That's not true. It's all, it's exactly like I wrote. So, I mean, that's, you know, you, you can look at the paper, for example, with the action. It's all, it's been exactly done. So uh, you know, there's no issue. That, actually there's like ten papers even later, which all of them do. Maybe papers, a thousand papers. Then, but then my question will be that why does, uh, say for instance, LIGO and Virgo, we, who do the post-Newtonian corrections very, very accurately, taking into account of non-relativistic, relativistic corrections, everything, why don't they see these effects? Or these terms are present in any of those computations? So yeah, of course they're, they're of course they're present there. Absolutely. You know, yeah. one can check. But it. they don't. No, they're exactly, these are exactly the same terms as there. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing special about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we just put them onto a quantum superposition matter wave. That's all. You just couple it. It's exactly the same. So there's nothing different on the, on the post-Newtonian expansion side. Uh, I think the only difference is that we're seeing uh, uh, that, you know, how does the quantum dynamics change for, uh, for these systems in the presence of these? So, so it's, I, I, I really like your question in the sense that uh, it, it helps to highlight this is not, not trying to do something speculative or different than usual. It's doing the same thing as usual. Uh, so you just take a probe, you know, like the, that's what I'm saying. Uh, you start with like mass action M times D tau. That's where LIGO starts or, or any of them. And, and that's, that's all what we do as well. It's only just putting, if you put it in a quantum context, there is some actually effect that has been overlooked. But it's not a, it's not, it's not like a different effect than uh, than time dilation. It's just that time dilation in this context also entangles your system. This is my another point. What leads to this entanglement? Uh, the time dilation. No, this is a, this is not a. I think there is a huge misconception in this uh, case. But maybe we we can discuss these things later. Maybe that's. But there is a huge misconception. Yeah, but but okay. But you're saying in such a strong way. I mean, uh, I mean, it's okay if I don't convince you. But I mean, um, okay. If there's an experiment that sees that, well, okay. Well, uh, there's the simulation experiment. That's obviously as exactly confirmed what we predict. It's the, so the point is we're not say, saying something speculative, and not at all. Like that's even the point I wanted to raise. It's no, not a new theory. I don't understand it from field theory perspective at all. So. Right. So the field theory, I. Uh, you know, I, I don't have the right intuition to give it, but uh, I have, um, you know, I can tell you that in this um, action formalism, it works fine, which is perfectly fine, of course, for a relativistic uh, thing. But, uh, but again, I mean, don't think of field theory. Gravity does not enter here in any way except for minimal coupling. So you, do, you can do field theory on curved space time, and that's, that's all there is. I mean, I think I think one good way is how how Igor answered uh, in terms of number of colelas, incoherent colelas with different masses. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to think of it. Many 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 mixture of many many colela like experiments, but each time the masses are different. Right, and and they are different because uh, the mass energy equivalence kind of tells you that each energy level gives a different mass. Yeah. So on that, on that, that's on the lowest level. But then, you know, if you want to go beyond the mass energy equivalence, it's just literally because the proper time is slightly different for you. So, so somehow uh, your effect should be more pronounced on if you had more uh, like wobbly masses, like a, say a helium droplet as opposed to a solid uh, mass and stuff like that, right? Uh, that effect does not somehow come in your KT if everything is, is a, there should be some yeah, easier. So, yeah, so there's this generic uh, energy variance that enters. Uh, and you're right, uh, it could be like slightly different system where the energy is higher. So this KT is just an example where you just have a thermal state, but you could have a different energy variance. Uh, so yeah, if you have a bubbling system, I guess, I mean, it gets complicated because now it is, you know, you interfere with it, and maybe there's other effects, but uh, um, you, you're right, it's not optimized. Let's say with our numbers that we give here is just kind of to get a feel at least for the decoherence part. But, uh, are there other questions? We have taken quite a bit of time, but uh, anyone else wants to ask? Uh...
Well, if not, then uh, we formally close the meeting, but uh, we can still, uh, you know, discuss.